So next up, environmental change. And so those indirect forces led to actually where we get resource extraction, forest deforestation, pollution being created. Uh, and what's that? Strip mining. Um, I'll talk about strip mining. Maybe. Um, so we're going to now focus in on environmental change. And um, so once again, uh, if we go back to that first thing I posed at the beginning as far as that question that will be on the exam four, all I'm going to want you to do is fill out each of these five boxes, but then give me a description, and not one sentence, not two sentences, but a full nuanced description of human driving forces. What do I mean by that? Human activities. What do I mean by that? And environmental change. No more. I'm not going to ask you about any of this stuff. Cool? Got it? Good deal. All right. Uh, so let's just kind of look at our own, let's look at God's country here. Less than 1% of the ecosystems that once supported an array of species in Indiana remain today. And so in the last 150 to 200 years, 99% of what was here is no longer. So obviously, what's the big equalizer, the big changer there? It wasn't, you know, some bird flu that got, you know, it's humans. Uh, so there's no doubt we can see our impact today. Further, we've converted 40% of Earth's ice-free land to crop, uh, crop land or pasture. And so essentially, to meet those demands I talked about beforehand, to meet those consumption habits, to meet the, you know, the production, all of that, essentially what we've done is we've changed the landscape. Changed the landscape, we can see that big time if you go anywhere north of here. All of that ag used to be nothing but forests. Yeah, it's flat. We learned that. Glaciers flattened it out. We all learned, and we know that. But that, if you would have gone, it would have been nothing but marshlands and forests all throughout northern Indiana. You go there today, and it's this flat and nothing but ag and windmills now. Um, so here we can see evidence of that. Further, the Great Plains. The Great Plains of the United States is the most, the largest, contiguous, human-altered place anywhere in the world. That is the most altered place as far as our, you know, a large swath of area anywhere. Uh, even Russia, China, India, whoever. Uh, it's amazing how much has changed there in the Great Plains over time. Jeez. Oh. Oh. All right, so let's get through just a little bit of this, and we'll uh, stop at 5.30 here for the map quiz. All right, so in terms of environmental change, uh, there's a few different ways in which we're going to look at environmental change. We're going to look at one of them right now. Uh, then we'll have, I think, a two or three more that I'll add to that video. And then that's it. That's it for the semester. We're done. But here, environmental change. So the first idea is we're altering the natural state of things. So that's kind of, that's, that's the main idea. Uh, via those indirect and direct impacts, those activities, we have then changed the natural state of things. Once again, 99% of once was, what once was here in Indiana is no longer. That is a major change to what was the natural state of things. And of course, that's a lot of it population re reflected, uh, but also affluence. Over time, of course, the United States, we, you know, we grew population-wise, but at the same time we grew affluence-wise. And so all these various things, all these various examples, you're going to hear me explain either today in the remaining 10 minutes or in the following video lecture. Uh, that I'll make and crank out uh, sometime in the next couple days. Uh, but the first off, first thing, shrieking ozone. Uh, so we'll look at some before and after photos where there's no doubt that the ozone is shrinking. And we've talked about that beforehand this semester. Why did we learn about the ozonosphere way back when? Well, when we understand, well, how does it change? Why does it matter when it changes? Why does the composition of it changing play a role in temperature uh, or the amount of solar energy that reaches the surface? Uh, and so, of course, a shrinking ozone is a shrinking layer that protects us from the harmful UV rays that I really, really bored you with back in, man, back in August. Remember that? Back when it was hot out? Anyway. Uh, and so further draining wetlands. Uh, and so that's, uh, we, we've seen that throughout northern Indiana. Remember I showed you that slide or that image of, uh, of that swampy, marshy area last time? And I asked you where that was hoping you'd say Florida. I think the person said, oh, that's Indiana. Yep, it's Indiana. Um, so our northern part of the state used to be loaded with all these marshes, but over time, we filled them in so we can flatten them and then, of course, turn it into ag. Uh, so when you remove a wetland, you remove all those species that then thrive in that area, the food cycle, food pyramid, all those various critters that depend on each other. Increased urbanization, uh, so essentially turning 
uh, desert into urban areas, turning forest areas into urban areas. Of course, what's that going to do? It's going to increase the temperature there due to the urban heat island effect, which we've talked about beforehand. Dam construction, strip mining, parking lots, anthropogenic pollution, and all of that. Climate change, we won't touch. Uh, 100 level classes, I don't like touching the sticky stuff, the stuff that gets people all pissed off. Uh, maybe if down the road I get teaching a 200, 300, 400 level class, we'll just we'll pick apart these deeper things, but not in this class. I tried it before, it didn't work. Uh, it didn't work too well. All right, so before and after photos. And, uh, before the, and if someone sends me an email and reminds me, I'll send these lecture notes to you. How about that? Uh, but you have to send me, because I'll forget. Guarantee you I'll forget. Uh, I want one of those. Um, oh, da, da, da. All right, so here we have 1979, uh, the year in which I was born. Uh, and here we have a much different situation today. And so the ozone is shrinking, or I guess it's expanding. If we look at this hole, the hole's getting bigger, uh, which once again allows UV rays, in this case, because it's in the South Pole, to then hit this ice sheet and cause it to melt uh, and so forth. Uh, I think we've seen that one before. Yeah, this is, remember, this is, in, this is Indiana. Yeah, this is Indiana. Uh, uh, you look at uh, one of the fastest growing cities in the entire country, Miami. Uh, Miami's just right up there against the Everglades. Uh, and so Miami, draw this real quick, Miami looks something like this. It's right here in this area here. And then, boom, we have the Everglades right through here. And so what's happening is as we get migration coming in, Latinos, Cubans, and then migration coming down, Jerry Seinfeld's parents, uh, you know, snowbirds, uh, New York, New Jersey people, what's happening is this area here is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so what's happening is the Everglades are essentially being drained. And why is that a big deal? You know, the Everglades, what they do is they're essentially the sponge for all that water that lands here in Florida. And so it essentially soaks up all that moisture so it's not on the surface. And so it essentially acts like a sponge. And when you remove that sponge, what's going to happen? You're going to increase the amount of flooding. Because uh, once again, you're removing that natural sponge that was there uh, all along. Uh, strip mining. So here, uh, stri strip mining. Uh, so here we see, um, uh, this is an area, these, all these red uh, uh, areas uh, illustrate uh, uh, places in which they have uh, strip mining. Oh, oh. yikes. I buy a number, Alex. What am I doing? Oh, yeah. All right, so here we have this creamy nougat of coal. Here's this creamy nougat of coal. And so to capture, to go after, to extract that creamy nougat of coal inside this mountain, we could drill in here, get to that. But man, that would take a long time, take a lot of resources. The best thing to do, and that's, I'm not suggesting this, but the easiest thing to do, stick some dynamite in here and just blow the freaking top off this thing. Um, so that essentially what you do is you remove that. Now, you just get out your bulldozers, get out whatever, and look how close that creamy nougat of coal is to the surface. And so strip mining, to understand how and why it's done, it makes sense. You can get to that coal much easier. Uh, but has anybody been to West Virginia? What would you go there for? Um, where's that, Charleston? Morgan. Oh, you, oh, you, oh you, so you would, uh, wow, okay, cool, right on. Uh, did you ever do anything outdoors, like outside of there? Yeah. What'd you do? We went skiing. Above. Skiing? Um, whitewater rafting? Yeah, we did that. Whitewater rafting. It's become one of the big industries in uh, West Virginia. So they had all this coal. Now they have whitewater rafting. This is great. They're getting new people to come in. And so what's happening, though, is, okay, here we have our nice little places for whitewater rafting to occur. But what's happening is all that debris, all of that, all that was what was once here is now filling up down in the valleys. And so one of the problems that they're now having in West Virginia is a lot of their rivers that were previously used for whitewater rafting are essentially covered in and filled up with all this debris from the removal of that mountaintop. Uh, and so here we can see how one thing is actually impacting another economy. Uh, and so there are some places that actually have shut down their whitewater rafting because essentially you're going to be wa water. I'm doing the, the Gangnam style thing almost. Uh, you're, instead of white, white, you'll be on rocks instead of water. Uh, and that probably changed. You'll probably not be as, uh, maybe you'll like that. Maybe you like you know, uh, going down on rocks instead of on uh, white, white rafting, actually on, on water. Anyway, uh, so why do I show this? Why do I show New York City? Let me see that.
What powers New York City? Coal from Appalachia. And nuclear, yeah, it's becoming, it's, it's, it's becoming a bigger thing. Oh, yeah, I, 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 I agree, I agree. I mean, it's becoming a bigger thing. But you know, before the nuclear thing came, all of what New York City was powered on was that coal from Appalachia, that resource extraction, human activity from Appalachia is actually, you know, it, we can see it. We can tie it into indirect affluence technology. Uh, we can tie it. It's not like these people are consciously, by turning on their lights, impacting the environment. But we can see how it starts to relate to those different types of jobs and what have you. So that must be a before and after. All right, so here's 2009. Uh, here's all this area here is strip mine. Uh, so here's natural. Here's what it would normally look like. Here's what it looks like today. Uh, and so actually what you can see is Mother Nature is fairly resilient. Uh, and so she does come back. And you can kind of see how she's starting to come back here uh, with this green area starting to reclaim this area. But once again, all the debris, it's, it's not like it's you know, back to what it was at all. Um, so here I think this is going to be before and after probably. Yeah, so there's before. Come on, I don't have time for this. To after. Uh, so here. Environmental change. Can we see it? No doubt. Can we understand and relate it to other things besides just people just cutting down you know, mountaintops? Yeah, with demand for uh, these types of energies. Um, anyway, soil degradation. Uh, so soil degradation all throughout the world. And so why is this a big issue? Uh, as far as soil, topsoil. To make that layer of topsoil, it takes 80 to 400 years just to form one centimeter of topsoil. And so think about that, how long it takes to form it, but how quickly all that can just go, you know, go, go to waste. So all that can just, just wiped out. Uh, and so something that takes 40 to, you know, 40 to, sorry, 80 to 400 years, boom, gone just by, you know, a guy coming in and plowing the field. Um, 2000, this is the Aral Sea. Uh, the Aral Sea, this is Aral Seas over here in, uh, um, uh, over here in Central Europe, uh, and then kind of over there by Russia. Uh, so here it is, it's a sea, uh, called the Aral Sea, but it's really just a lake. Uh, it's a lot like Salt Lake City, or Salt, the Great Salt Lake, in which it doesn't have any rivers that take its water and take it to an ocean. So it's in a big basin. And so one of the things that's happened over time here is farmers in this area have siphoned off the water, have siphoned off the water before it gets to the Aral Sea. Why? They want it somewhere else. Irrigation. Irrigation, big time. And so look how dry this area is. And so essentially, the rivers that flow into this, what they're doing is they're capturing that water and using it to water their fields in a very, very dry area. And so the net result we see here as far as the Aral Sea is shrinking. And so the Aral Sea, it's a salty sea or non-salty sea? Salty sea. So one person's been listening. So it's a salty sea. And so all that salt is sitting there. Where does it go? Nowhere. And so as that water shrivels up, what we have is we have a lot of salt that now is all, all around here. Then you have a little bit of wind. Wind then moves that salt onto various guys' farm fields. Is salt good for a field? No, it only increases the whole demand for water because essentially that salt, as you know, salt makes your mouth you know, dry, essentially dries everything out and so it kind of compounds the problem even more. Can you close the door to someone? And so now we see the after, the Aral Sea is shrinking. Thank you. The Aral Sea is shrinking. And so this is all related to demand for that water here in this area of the world. Uh, uh, it's very heavily agricultural based, uh, which goes back to uh, the previous uh, sector. I was once the fourth largest lake in the world. Now it's just a little shrivel, uh, which you can see these, these boats, are just, they got nowhere to go. So they just essentially have been dropped in place. Oh, yeah, positive story. Let's, let's end on a good news. Uh, and so because of this, because uh, uh, people in this area of the world took geography classes, became aware of their human impact on the environment, they started changing their strategies, changing their behaviors. And so one of the things we see is the Aral Sea is starting to come back slowly but surely. This, I need to hate these transitions. Uh, yeah, all right, anyway. Does it really do anything different? Thank you, thank you.
There's Las Vegas. There's the urban area of Las Vegas. This is all desert. Boom, boom. Why is, why is Vegas growing? Why, why, why is its population growing? Casinos. They're building new casinos left and right, hotels. If you go to Vegas, I mean, you see this. New construction happening all over the place. Why are people wanting to move there? A lot of people are retiring there. A lot of people are moving there because there's jobs available. Casinos, they don't lose. If they, lo- if they lost, this wouldn't be happening, obviously. Uh, you know, they wouldn't have people you know, coming to their brand new, uh, you know, all their stuff. All right, cool. Got through